It's time to talk Big 12 football on the Our Lads Football Network. And it's something that we have, uh, for whatever reason, just haven't been very fortunate so far uh, as far as uh, getting uh, as many interviews as we'd like for the Big 12. Uh, matter of fact, uh, the one interview that we did conduct, which was our first, uh, happened to be the new member, one of the new members of the Big 12. We did talk BYU football, but now we're going to talk Oklahoma State football. And that means Scott Wright from the Oklahoman is joining us once again. Scott, thanks for checking in with us again. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Well, it's uh, it's nice to get the opportunity to talk about this part of the country. And again, this uh, conference, which is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, and uh, Oklahoma State just happens to be the the, the main fixture, uh, thanks to their head coach, who's now what nineteenth year, Gundy. Yes, that's correct. So, how many other coaches in college football have more than nineteen years at the same school? Uh, not very many. I <laughs> no, I don't think so. Uh, I think Kyle Whittingham at, at Utah might be uh, might be uh, just a few weeks ahead of Gundy. But oh, is uh, that oh okay. Cool. They're yeah, literally the same year. So not a lot, not a lot of guys out there that have done this. Yeah, let's see. There's uh let's see, we have Kirk Ferentz. Yes. And he's been yeah, he's been there a long time. And yeah, Winningham, what, 99, I think, yeah, like you said, the same year, 19 years for winning him. But that just shows you how the school the program with all the changes, uh, whether it's alignment or especially just uh, in general, it's uh, coaches just come and go. Uh, but uh, Gundy, he's had some turmoil, as you're going to experience over 19 years. Uh, but uh, is he just – you think this is going to be his job and he's going to stay here until he says, I'm done being a head coach and it's time for me to retire? Yeah, I think so. I think he's reached that point now. Um, you know, If you'd asked me back in, in 2019, 2020 – I would have told you that that kind of felt like maybe he was he was getting toward the end of his run, but um, you know they had uh, they had some leadership changes at Oklahoma State uh, with a couple of uh, of retirements from the athletic director and, and president. The uh, the the new staff, Chad Weiberg as athletic director, Casey Strom as president. They get along really well with Gundy. They understand him. He understands them and they can work together on goals, whereas that wasn't always the case with with Mike Holder as the previous athletic director. So different focus now. It's a uh, uh, Gundy is in a really good situation in terms of his his happiness and and uh, his feeling that the administration is on the same page as him. So I could see him going for a while longer now at this at this point. And basically, like you said, when he wants to hang him up, that's when they'll be done with him. How old is Gundy? 56. Oh, he's still, he's got a ways to go. Yeah. So that, that's good. And, and fans, they, for the most part, they're all bought into Gundy. Yeah. For the most part. I mean, they, they sold out uh, season tickets, which they've never done in the, in the preseason, which is really kind of surprising considering the way last season ended. Yeah. They finished seven and six and, and obviously the horrible second half of the season. Uh, but yeah, they sold out season tickets this, this year, something they're really excited about. So, um, yeah, for the most part, there's obviously there's always the haters out there for for every coach, no matter how much success you're having. But for the most part, Gundy has the uh, has the support behind him from the fans. All right. Now, uh, some of the things, uh, big things that I noticed uh, doing some research for this for this interview. You take a look. First of all, not a very experienced team. So that that that's something that we'll uh, we'll go over. So transfers uh, might come into play, uh, and and it pretty much is the case all over the country. But uh, when you're an inexperienced team, transfers can really help you. But the schedule, uh, this is probably I don't know. Sometimes you go, well, I'd prefer to have that schedule when we're set up. But when you are kind of rebuilding, that's kind of looks like what Oklahoma is doing. I'm sure, Gundy wouldn't admit that but it does appear that way the schedule cannot be any easier uh no texas no tcu no baylor no texas tech those are four considered four like the top six teams in the conference and they get the three new teams and they get them all in a row to end the season three of them four of them excuse me four and they get four or five of them at the end of the season yes exactly so yeah, it it shook out really well, I think, for for Oklahoma State. It's weird not having those Texas schools. Uh, obviously, you know, 
the University of Texas is heading to the SEC after this. So so that series is is done for the foreseeable future unless they bring it back in non-conference somewhere down the line. Texas Tech and Baylor especially, but also TCU are, are programs that, that you could see developing into that new rivalry in the conference for, for Oklahoma State. Uh, now that, that OU is going to be leaving as well, and the, the Bedlam rivalry is dead. So is it really dead? They're not uh, going to. I would say uh, I would say for a minimum fifteen years. Maybe wow. they try to move back after that. But um, you know, you look at, at where um, Oklahoma State, in particular, speaking from their perspective, you know, they want to play one Power Five or whatever it's going to be, <laughs> whatever okay. happens with Pac twelve, but um, one major conference team in the non-conference every year and they're booked all the way through with except the exception of a couple of little holes all the way through uh, 2036 now Jeez. so um you know so we'll see we'll see what happens down the line if they decide they want to try to bring that back but um but back to to the schedule yeah it, it shapes up really well kansas state is obviously a, a team that a lot of people are excited about uh, but oklahoma state gets them at home on a Friday yep. night, which should be a, a fantastic atmosphere at Boone Pickens Stadium. So, a lot of uh, a lot of good things on this schedule in yeah. terms of of Oklahoma State's perspective. I mean, it's possible that they're favored in every road game. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That could that could definitely happen. You know, it's hard to know what the new schools are going to look like sure. when they get into this conference. And and yeah, you could absolutely see that. Um, you know, they have to go to Houston and to Central Florida. They're only uh, they're only road games against new teams. And I, I certainly think that they're uh, that they're the favorite in those as well. Yeah, which means that it's very possible they could be favored in nearly every game. Again, depending yes. on whether this team is better than last year. And and look, they, they would have. We all know they would have had a much better end of the season if it wasn't for the quarterback injury uh, right. to Sanders, and he's now gone. And we can kind of start with that because, of course, that's a big position. And I'm going to also throw up the uh, depth chart. Uh, from our lads so uh, the viewers can uh, see what we're talking about so Alan Bowman now as a, as a Michigan fan I've seen Bowman on the sidelines the past couple of years and just always thought that was an interesting decision with all the places he could have gone why did he go to Michigan I mean I guess if there's an injury sure uh, but he was third on that depth chart at the time um I don't know. Maybe he just uh, there was other personal reasons, but now he's back, and I got to I got to imagine now he's itching to play, uh, which is the reason why he's transferred, and he's more than likely the starter. Correct? Yeah, it certainly seems that way. Mike Gundy hasn't come out and said that yet. We speak to him here in a couple of days for his last media availability before the season opener. We'll see if he goes ahead and, and stamps it and makes it official. Um, you know, I, I thought back to 2019 when he had Spencer Sanders as a uh, redshirt freshman. Uh, he didn't. He didn't come out and, and proclaim him the starting quarterback. Said they suggested he might play two quarterbacks in the opener, which was up at Oregon State that year. And Sanders came out, had a great game, and and just took off, exploded into his career. So we'll see what exactly happens. But uh, not only do I feel like Bowman is is the guy that they that they want it to be, he's the guy that they need it to be because they're really inexperienced behind him. Garrett Rangel played. Uh, four games, three as a starter after Spencer Sanders got hurt last year. Gunnar Gundy also started one game. They don't have a, a lot of experience behind him. You get back to Zane Flores, who is a, a true freshman who's only been on campus since uh, since January. So, um, yeah, they, they need Bowman to be that guy because of his experience, his understanding. And, and with some of the changes they're making to this offense, getting a little bit more under center, uh, a little bit, not necessarily uh, getting too much away from the spread, but but working in the tight end a little bit more, some okay. different blocking schemes. It kind of blends Alan Bowman's two stops in his career because they're going to do some some air raid style stuff that he ran at Texas Tech. They're going to do some of the stuff that he obviously, as a practice quarterback, a, a third teamer, was was learning and and running at Michigan. So it's uh, it's a good situation for him, and and they I think are really excited about what he could do in this offense. Yeah, he's – I mean, he's the difference maker without question because he had some really good moments at Texas Tech as a freshman. Yeah. So he was he – and, and Oklahoma State fans got, got got torched by him a couple of times. He's thrown for almost 800 yards in two appearances at Boone Pickens Stadium. Wow. So they're hoping he can keep that trend up. 
that shows you how long he's been in college football. Yes. So, uh, yeah, so that's big because, yeah, th- if anything were to happen to Bowman, I don't know what happens to the season. So you, you mentioned Flores. Was he one of, if not the top recruit also this year? He was right up there, uh, you know, depending on, on on where you look. He was uh, one of the top probably three guys in the class. They felt like they got a steal. He was a guy out of Gretna, Nebraska, that that they identified, the quarterback coach, Tim Rattay identified him early on, and and they were one of the first big programs to come in on this guy. You know, he's 6'3", 205, more athletic than they even realized because he didn't try to run a whole lot in high school. They got him down here, and 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 he could move around really well. Um, you know, he's the one. You know, obviously the newest guy has the has the most promise sometimes when you're uh, when you're looking at these things from the outside. But he's a guy that they're really excited about. You know, whenever. Uh, uh, whenever Matt Rule got the Nebraska job, he came in and 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 tried to to lure Flores away, but uh, couldn't make it happen. So they really like what they've got in him. Looking at looking long term, and uh, you know when when Bowman's done after this season, you got Rangel, Gundy, and, and and Flores all battling for that job in 2024. Could make it really intriguing. Okay, all right. Now uh, let's take a look at the skill positions and two key guys return. Uh, Gordon in the backfield and Presley at wideout. So uh, Gordon, still a young pup. Uh, how good can Gordon be? He, you know, he really looks like he's got the tools to be a big time player. Six one. They list him at two eleven. He looks bigger than that when you're hmm. when you're standing next to him. Very physical runner. He'll run guys over, but he's got some speed. He's uh, he he's got a, a spin move that's pretty ridiculous. And and he can uh, he can catch the ball out of the backfield. He can do a lot. So it feels like he has a chance to be really good. They're not going to go crazy pumping the ball to him, especially early on, because they want to keep these guys healthy for the long term. So you're going to see Jaden Nixon work in there. He's a redshirt sophomore who's especially effective in 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 the passing game. Okay. And Elijah Collins from Michigan State, who has had sort of sort of an up and down career while he was there. Uh, you know, looked like he was moving into a, kind of a primary role, and then they had some other guys come in, including Kenneth Walker the third, who's who's doing his thing in in the NFL now. So he he's kind of his his usage rate kind of went up and down during his four years at Michigan State but he's a big guy 220 pounds that they feel can come in and and really help them out so those three are going to get a lot of action and they feel really comfortable with all three of them at the at the uh the number one spot yeah that is definitely a strength and then you know we talk about Presley so he is going to be important uh he put up some good numbers last year even without Sanders almost half the season so um Probably looking at a thousand yard receiver, aren't we? Yeah, I absolutely think so. You know, you look uh, you look back at, at Alan Bowman's career, particularly at Texas Tech. Obviously, uh, he used his slot receivers a lot, so you can see a strong connection building between those two guys. Presley is a uh, you know he he has the ability to be a downfield threat, but they don't use him that way a lot. They like to get him in space underneath and and let him go make plays because he is so elusive. So you could really see that developing. And with with some recent developments, he's probably going to be on the field a little bit more than they would like. His backup, Arlen Bruce the fourth, who transferred in from Iowa, was recently named in the in the investigation into the gambling um, situation going on up there at, at Iowa. So um, so he is. Uh, most likely never going to play college football again, but uh, but certainly right now not participating in any team activities. So uh, when you look at that at that slot receiver, they're going to try to keep Presley, I think, on the field as much as they can. Okay, so so really, there's no word, nothing definitive uh, for Bruce right now. Correct. No okay. no ruling from the NCAA right now. He's only been named in the the allegations. So we'll see uh, how that how that transpires. He was a guy that they were really excited about. And thought had had a chance to really help them as uh, you know backing up Presley in the slot and also in the in the return game. Okay. So who should possibly step up then, as far as the rest of the receiving core? Because I believe four guys from the receivers in general are gone. So yeah. as you mentioned, Bruce was going to be a big part of the, some of the new guys. Um, you have an interesting uh, kid who put up huge numbers, but that was a D3 Leon Johnson, a 6'5 guy, and then another transfer Stribling. So talk about the, uh, the transfers and if anybody has popped out uh, you know, regarding uh, summer, spring, or even now fall. Yeah, you know, both of those transfers are intriguing, particularly Stribling. He was the leading receiver at Washington State last year. 
six three two oh five and and has a lot of skill. So he's a guy that I could see becoming sort of a uh, sort of a go to guy on the outside. Um, and then Leon Johnson, I think, will be more of a rotational guy because he is making the jump from Division Three up to Division One. Um, even been some some speculation they might think about redshirting him because he does have another. Uh, he's never redshirted before, so okay. they could uh, they could redshirt him and give him a little bit more time, and uh, you know maybe you get those four games out of him, and then and then see what happens after that. So uh, we'll see. But but they are really excited about him, and he's been playing well, showing some uh, some real talent as he as he develops. As far as guys that are uh, that have been with the program, both Jaden Bray and Blaine Green are guys who dealt with a lot of injuries. Blaine Green didn't play at all last year. Bray only played uh, three or four games. So uh, those are two guys that they were really excited about as freshmen in 2021. They were really impactful guys on on that team that was really talented and obviously went 12 and two and beat Notre Dame in the Fiesta Bowl. So they were making impact then. They feel like they're uh, they're they've progressed more and are ready to be guys that uh, that can really get involved you know Blaine Green's gonna kind of be a, a your your big inside receiver type of guy uh and then and then Bray is a uh, is a downfield threat with he's six two six two two hundred pounds and really long arms um he's a he was a basketball player who really understands the jump ball the, the fade route really well so that's that'll be something they uh, they utilize with him so they've got a lot of guys then you've got some other guys that have uh, that have had their moments to shine talon shetron was you know one of the top recruits two years ago okay and uh, has dealt with some injuries and and uh, now has a chance to uh, to really shine rashad owens the guy that that Every time you talk to him, it feels like he's playing a new position. They had tried to to uh, to bulk him up last season and move him to tight end, and uh, you know he was able to help a little bit as a as a receiver in that role. But now they've got him back, uh, slimmed down to about two fifteen and playing receiver again. So he's he's played inside, he's played outside, he's played tight end. He can do a lot of things for this offense and and be kind of a utility man to step in where they need him. Speaking, of, and it sounds like there's some possibilities there. Uh, so maybe nobody knows who these guys are outside of uh, Stillwater, but uh, there, there's possibilities, and that's what college football is all about. Uh, you just never know sometimes from year to year. Uh, tight end, you mentioned tight end. So will the transfer from UMass, will he be considered? Is he considered the top guy? I kind of see it that way right now from uh, from from what I've taken from preseason. He has, has really uh, – really elevated himself and I think he's going to be the guy that that, that steps in there he was you know he's an interesting guy he was originally a, a wing T quarterback when he when he signed with UMass moved to tight end he's he's big at 6'5 250 and and can go and be physical and they're they're asking him to block first they're really getting okay. their tight ends more involved in the blocking game okay. in, in the run game this year than they have in the past uh, whereas they get uh, you know they used to like to really get that guy out and you know, maybe line him up in the slot, make him a receiver more more frequently. Going to cr- try to keep him in the line and and block. But he is a guy that is athletic enough and understands route concepts and reads defenses like a quarterback. So he's 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 got the capability to go be a, a good receiver. And um, you know, Quentin Stewart is a, a guy that's been around that they that they really like. Eden, 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 Ian Edenfield is the guy that that is really intriguing because he's going to find a role. He's uh, you know he's probably the third team guy right now, but he's going to find a, a, kind of a, a niche in this offense. He's 270 pounds and very physical, but he, he's coming up from Division Two football, so okay. it's a different level. It's it's one thing to uh, to take on a a Division Two defensive end as, as opposed to a, a Big 12 defensive yes. end. So, there is a there is a learning process there, but he's really developing, and, and I think is a guy that can really help in the blocking game. All right. Uh, by the way, uh, do they use because not I don't see a, on depth charts anymore the fullback position. Uh, they, so they they have uh, they have that's a change that really just happened with this uh, back in spring with this change to uh, to get the tight end more involved. They wanted specific guys at tight end, specific guys at fullback. So it's it's an interesting change because those guys were always sort of just one group, and you know, you just didn't know where they were going to be lined up, whether they were on the line or as a wing back or in a traditional fullback role. But yeah. now they've got, they've got some guys with uh, particularly Braden Cassidy, a, a, a guy who was a defensive end who switched over to the other side of the ball. 
um, and and Jake Schultz did the same thing as well. So those two guys are are running at uh, at, at fullback, and um, and Bryce Drummond is another one that has recently made the switch from tight end to fullback, and he's an intriguing guy too. He was a, another one that was a, a quarterback when he came out of high school, transferred from North Texas. Um, for any uh, any Food Network fans, he's the uh, the son of the pioneer woman on the Food Network. Okay, so he's going to move from tight end to fullback. Yes. Okay. All right. So, and and you think they're going to use that position? That's going to be legitimate. Where you yeah. think you're going to see more of the tight end blocking, the fullback. He's yes. going to be a lead blocker, and that's going to be uh, a, a little bit of a new concept for this offense. That's exactly okay. right. They they really struggled the last two years to block in the running game, and it was a, a really strong emphasis. Um, you know, two years ago, the 2021 team, uh, Jalen Warren. Uh, emerged as this guy that they thought was maybe a third string running back when he transferred in from from utah state and you know if you're pittsburgh Steelers fans know how good he has become now at the at the next level uh he bailed this offensive line out a lot in 2021 last year they didn't have a running back that was capable of bailing them out that way and so they they realized they really needed to get back to some physical running game and uh, and and reemphasize the tight end the fullback and, and some of those things all right let's talk about the offensive line because uh, this is where there's experience coming back and that's uh, very important so uh do they feel pretty good about what uh what, what they have out there this season they do because because they do have a lot of guys uh that that have played quite a few games they've got guys in the 2d that that have uh, a lot of game experience cole birmingham is a guy that it's hard to know exactly where he's going to end up right now. He's okay. kind of a uh, kind of a guy that could could bounce around and play some different spots. He started games at right guard. He started uh, the majority of the 2021 season at left tackle. So he can do a lot of things and uh, and might not even end up being a starter. Though I think he's got a chance to uh, to maybe maybe jump somebody and, and get into that starting five. But um, you know, Jason Brooks Jr. was a guy from uh, from Vanderbilt who transferred in last season. And really became, I think, their uh, their most consistent run blocker. So he's obviously got an important role, I think, at uh, at that left guard position this season. So that's a uh, that's a really big one. And then from the center going over to the right, you've got Joe Maholsky, Preston Wilson, and and Jake Springfield, guys that have have all made several starts in their careers. Springfield has, it was it was a former walk on who was starting at right right tackle by uh, by his redshirt freshman season as a walk on. So um, guys that are uh, that are really important. Preston Wilson has has started at every position other than left tackle. So okay. he he knows this offense. He uh, he understands all the concepts. And and these guys are really excited about some of the power stuff that they put back in. Oh yeah. In the spring to get away from some of the zone stuff. That's and, right. And go yeah. go hit guys and they're. Right. Uh, would Springfield be considered the top lineman on the team, or uh, I mean, Dalton it's, Cooper? Uh, is, yeah, yeah, Cooper. I didn't, I didn't talk about him. He was a guy that, that missed some time in spring after he transferred. Uh, you know, coming from Texas State, there's obviously a uh, an adjustment period for him as well. But he's a guy that they really like. I mean, they had a returning guy at left tackle in Caleb Etienne, who started every game last season, played the most snaps of any player on their offense. Uh, but they felt like they could upgrade, and they and they brought in Cooper to 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 compete. And uh, ETN decided to uh, to transfer to BYU. So, okay. um, but Cooper is a guy who uh, you go look at, at at his stats, and and yeah, it's at, at a group of five school, but um, you know, very few uh, very few sacks allowed, very yep. few holding calls on him. Uh, he's he looks like a a really talented guy, and uh, we'll see we'll see what he's able to do as a uh, as a big 12 left tackle but they're excited about what he brings to the program yeah uh, definitely somebody to keep an eye on and now let's uh, swing over to the defensive side because there is a new defensive coordinator again and a new defensive scheme too correct yes exactly yes brian nardo comes in um obviously they went from uh from the 425 that was originally brought in by uh, jim knowles Back in 2018, he ran it for four years. They brought in Derek Mason last year, who uh, who stuck with that defensive scheme for the most part, and uh, and sort of sort of adapted it to, to what he was comfortable with. Uh, but he decided to take a sabbatical from from college coaching, and uh, and yeah, now Mike Gundy Mike Gundy has always loved the three three five. 
particularly the one the way that Iowa State runs it. Okay. And Brian Nardo, he was a, a defensive coordinator at Emporia State in Emporia, Kansas, a Division II school. And we're going way back. That's not where he came from. But, uh, uh, but, but back in 2017, he went up to Iowa State, learned the defense from their staff, and took it back to Emporia State, began to kind of make it his own. He's had a couple of other stops there since then, but uh, uh, most recently was at, at Gannon University in Erie, Pennsylvania, another Division II school. So okay. one of those unique Mike Gundy hires. Um, you know, Always going to get Mike a chance. From, uh, from, from the Division II level a, a few years ago as his offensive coordinator now, going back to, uh, to the state of Pennsylvania for a Division II coordinator on the defensive side in, in, in Brian Nardo. But they're really excited about this 3-3-5 scheme that's uh, like like I said, mostly based on what Iowa State does and, and some other programs that run it really well. Okay, and let's start up front. So this seems to be, and again now that to be a three man line, a um, mm -hmm. couple of guys that stick out are the are the the two transfers. You have uh, Goodlow, who I'm familiar with following uh, Tulsa football, and uh, Kirkland is interesting. I'm not familiar with him, but he's a big right. guy. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So talk about how those two guys were, were going to be important parts to their defense, to the Cowboys defense. Yeah, really, really critical ads from the transfer portal. I'll start with Goodlow. He's a uh, he's a veteran. It's funny. I was uh, I was actually on the high school beat when he was growing up in Dell City, just outside of Oklahoma City. Uh, I covered him his sophomore year. He was uh, he was a 200 pound safety back then. Wow. Now he's a 290 pound defensive end. And, uh, it's been kind of crazy watching his career develop, but uh, a very athletic guy for his size moves really well. Tulsa ran a, 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 a somewhat similar scheme to this. He's at least familiar with three man line and some of the things that that are required of him there. So uh, fits in really well with what he can do on the defensive line. Kirkland is a uh, is is a fascinating guy. Only a sophomore though, he is a little bit a little bit older, went on a Mormon mission after high school. Um, he's originally from Roy, Utah, uh, went to Utah Tech uh, out of uh, or for his for his first year of college, had a dominant year up there and jumped in the portal and ended up at Oklahoma State. 6 foot 4, 346 pounds. Uh, they he recently posted a, a video of uh, of him doing the bench press in a uh, in a workout he did 225 pounds 40 times Jeez. he's just massive and strong and and the 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 most interesting thing about him i think is that oklahoma state went out and brought him in when Derek mason was still defensive coordinator so they were still in a four-man line but he's perfect for for the nose guard spot yes. in a in a three-man line yeah. so it worked out really well for them you know, uh, Cody Walterscheid and Nathan Latou are two other guys that are going to rotate in a lot at okay. the two defensive end spots. They're guys that have been around that are, uh, um, you know, really settling in and and um, look like they're ready to to make significant impact. Colin Clay is another guy. You know, he was a uh, a defensive end at Arkansas back in 2019 as a as a true freshman. Came to Oklahoma State, dealt with some injuries, kind of bulked up and and moved to the inside and and now is in that nose guard spot. Uh, he and Kirkland, I think, will be the the two primary guys that you're going to see okay. at that nose guard spot that uh, that can really uh, really kind of cause some problems for some defense or for, for some offenses. And even though you see Colin Oliver on the depth chart as an outside linebacker, the fact is, is he's really more. Or maybe I'm wrong, but is he really going to be more of an edge rusher? I mean, he's, they're definitely going to use him that way, but he has he slimmed down a little bit, down to about two thirty five. He was up around two fifty last season okay. as a defensive end in the uh, the four man line. But when they go to a four man line, which they'll still do on occasion, he's the uh, he's always going to be there. But yeah, he is going to be an edge rusher, um, even from the linebacker position in the three man line. Uh, but they feel comfortable with him, his his agility and his speed. To be a traditional linebacker in 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 some respects, well, good so for him. That gets they, him more uh, experience do, doing different things. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, uh, you know, honestly, it's probably going to end up being a great thing for his career yep. because he was going to be an undersized defensive end when he tried to get to the uh, to the NFL level, and uh, and now this I think is a, a really good opportunity for him to further his career. Yeah. Uh, that nowadays they're, they'll find a way, but uh, especially if you can get to get, get after a quarterback. But the more mm -hmm. you can do, the better. Okay, so uh, regarding the linebackers in general, there's another Tulsa transfer. Mm -hmm. Is he going to be the, the the most impactful linebacker, Justin Wright? 
Yeah, I, I really think so. He's a, a guy that, um, you know, was was their first, I, I think he was their first portal uh, transfer that they uh, that they added back in the offseason. They lost Mason Cobb, who was the starter last year, transferred out to USC, and, uh, and they didn't waste any time in identifying Justin Wright as a guy that they felt could really help them at that middle linebacker spot. He's really just just your prototypical middle linebacker. Um, you know, has good uh, good speed, good side to side, and can really make some plays. But um, he's been a good leader. He's been a guy that blended really well with the group. Uh, they've got a lot of fun personalities in that in that linebacker group, and uh, and and he is kind of a glue guy and can kind of pull all those guys together. So they they really like what he can bring. And and behind him, Nick Martin is a guy that's uh, that's really taken some steps forward this okay. uh, this preseason. So they'll they'll probably give him a chance to uh, to step in and and try to keep right fresh from time to time, but they uh they're really excited about that middle linebacker spot and uh, and on the outside, Xavier Benson is a guy who who started every game last year but really struggled in making the jump from from junior college to uh, to Oklahoma State's defense. Okay, uh, you know he was a, a guy that uh, that looked lost at times, but has uh, Mike Gundy named is said that he was the guy who's made the most improvement from uh, from January to now on this team. So that's going to be a really important development for for them as well because he is a, a veteran that's very athletic. So uh, so you know understanding his role. And, and knowing where to be is going to make him a, a much better player. Yeah, that, that definitely looks like a, a formidable front seven, at least potentially. So mm-hmm. there are definitely some options there. And then now Kendall Daniels, is, is he basically considered, what is he, the rover? Yes, yeah, he's the rover, that middle safety, which, uh, you know, for people that know the three three five, that is uh, really probably the most important position yes. on the defense holds everything together. He's a guy that uh, that's got to be able to do a little bit of everything. Um, you know, you're going to he's going to be a middle linebacker in in some looks. He's going to be a, a deep safety in some. He'll be uh, you know, in man coverage in in, in some. Uh, he and and Kendall has shown the ability to be that kind of guy. He did he did some of that kind of stuff last season. He had three interceptions on the back end, had three and a half tackles for loss coming up in the box and 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 making uh, you know creating havoc up there so he's a guy that that can do all of those things got an nfl body at, at 6 4 205 though he says he's a little bit heavier than 205 now um but uh but but he really he looks the part and um, you know he was a, he was a part-time starter for uh, for the early part of last season then moved into a full-time role ended up being the uh, the big 12 defensive uh, freshman of the year so a lot of promise a lot of excitement about what he can do in this defense well, again, it just keeps uh, – it's why I love the, having these conversations because you would just look generally at all the inexperience and so forth, and you would just think, yeah, it's, it's just going to be a so-so kind of year. But I'm, I'm already seeing that there's a really good possibility that this, this team might be a surprise based on that schedule and mm-hmm. that there might be more talent here than people think. Uh, let's wrap up with the secondary, the rest of the secondary – uh, who would be considered, um, you know, the key guys back there? You know, one of the ones that I'm the most interested in is Trey Rucker. He okay. was a guy who uh, who came in. He, he left a scholarship at Wake Forest. His family had moved to Oklahoma. Uh, he wanted to, uh, to to get a little bit closer, but Oklahoma State didn't have a scholarship for him. But uh, but he walked on. Uh, you know, played some special teams his, his first year, then had some academic issues, didn't get to play until the bowl game last year, came in and had a really good game, had uh, had three tackles, had a pass breakup and an interception in the bowl game. Uh, so uh, so kind of uh, kind of kind of drew some spotlight and, and got people excited. I think he's got a chance to be a really important player in uh, in, in this defense. Lyric Rawls, another guy that's really grown up. And uh, also had a good bowl game that that really propelled him into the into the off season. Okay, Corey Black on on the corner is uh, is he's their shutdown guy. He's really shown some uh, some more development. He's been a guy that they've been excited about since he got he got here. They played him as a true freshman, even though they had uh, you know he was just a backup. They worked him in because they wanted to get him that experience, and uh, and he has really developed. They like his future, big strong body, and and they like what he can do. And then on the other side, uh, Cam Smith is a guy who uh, early October last season was third team. Corey Black gets hurt, and the backup gets hurt in the same game in 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 the middle of the first quarter, 
Cam Smith has to come in, and uh, he didn't he didn't play horrible that day, but he really developed a lot over the course of the season. And, and then into spring and now in in preseason camp, you know, they went out and got Kenneth Harris from Arkansas State in the uh, in the transfer portal because they didn't know what they were going to have yeah. at, at that other corner. And and Cam Smith has really held his own. Now, they might rotate those guys, give them both a chance. But, okay. uh, but Cam Smith has really stepped up and been an impressive guy in, in camp this season. And um, and then there's another transfer, too, that I see there. Is that uh, Ladarius Webb? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, the uh, the son of the uh, the former Baltimore Ravens safety of uh, of the same name. Oh, uh, that, that played with uh, you know, played with the, some of the Super Bowl teams with okay. uh, Ray Lewis and Ed Reed. Played with those dudes. So, um, yeah, a guy that really understands football. Um, he's a, a JUCO guy who had nine interceptions over over two seasons at at JUCO level, and has a chance to to really um, they they kind of see him. He's a guy who has the talent to play corner. But they like him kind of as a uh, as a slot corner, and so I think you'll see him rotate in in that role when uh, when they're going against some of the really good slot receivers in this league. All right, and then uh, wrap up with the uh, special teams. How's it looking as far as the kicking game? Lots of new faces. You know, they uh, they uh, their place kicker, their punter, and their long snapper all uh, all gone from last season. Okay, uh, the long snapper is hanging around in the uh, in the NFL, so he had uh, he was. Uh, a guy that there's not a lot of those jobs out there. So to get a chance to do that is, is, is pretty impressive. But um, Zeke Zaragoza is stepping in for him at left, left long snapper, um, a guy that's been around for a couple of years that, that, that they really like. Um, you know, they had Tom Hutton at punter last year. He was a, a four-year starter, a, a guy from Australia that they got through Pro Pick Australia there in, in Melbourne. And they went back there for Hudson Cock, the, uh, the, the true freshman that they're going to, most likely hand the job to okay. or most likely going to win the job okay. right now out of camp. So really, uh, really impressive uh, guy. Got a little bit stronger leg than Hutton. Uh, we'll just see if he can, uh, if he can become the, uh, the whiz at, uh, at locating the ball the way that Hutton was. So, and then Alex Hale, Alex Hale at place kicker was, uh, he was 13 of 14 in, in 2020 ends up tearing his ACL in Bedlam pregame in November Oof. and uh, and just, uh, you know, kind of lost his confidence coming back from that and ended up getting beat out for the job the last two seasons. Uh, but he's a guy that's got that talent and is uh, is settling back in. Logan Ward is uh, is pushing him as well. Logan Ward has a big leg, and he, it might be one of those situations where you see maybe Hale handles things from, uh, you know, 45 yards and in and, or 50 and 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 they when they need a long one they go to ward for okay. uh, for the long kicks so could be one of those type of situations all right and um i'm, I'm gonna ask you uh to uh, the closing question is gonna be can you give me especially since there's a lot of new faces that we just went over but can you give me specifically one player that you think might break out uh more than the others on offense and defense somebody that can become a household name whether it's this year or uh, just let's keep an eye on him. Uh, could be a freshman. Let's keep an eye on him in the next couple of years. But is there somebody on, on either side that we need to keep an eye on? Uh, yeah, I'm going to, I'm, I'm, you know, I mean, Ollie Gordon is a guy we talked about and he, yep. he does, does have some experience from last year, but nobody I knows who he is. Could, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think he's a guy that could, could really pop and become a big time player in this offense. Um, He's a guy that, that that I think has so many tools that he's going to fit a lot of situations that they want to do. Okay. And then um, then uh, up at receiver, I'm going to go with Jaden Bray. He's another guy that oh. uh, that people don't know a whole lot about. Um, I mentioned earlier he was a basketball player. Uh, didn't he, you know, he played football when he was little, then came back to it as a junior in in high school and was really raw when he got on campus. But very athletic, great hands, and uh, I think has a chance to uh, to really shine. Okay, and on defense, you got one name for me. Uh, defense, uh, well, we talked about Kendall Daniels. I, I, I think he's going to just explode in this in this defense. Um, beyond a, that, um, I tell you what, I'm going to go with Justin Kirkland. Uh, you know, he's going to be a guy that maybe he doesn't put up a ton of crazy stats at the end of the day, but he's going to take on a ton of double teams. He's going to show his strength in the interior of that defensive line and really open up things for other guys behind him to uh, to to make some plays. 
And uh, and one more that's uh, going back to the second line of the depth chart, Jeff Roberson at, at linebacker. He's going to be a guy that I think will occasionally uh, sneak in there and, uh, and and play in some certain situations. They really liked how he was coming on last season, had a chance to maybe be a starter a year ago, and then uh, and then uh, had a foot injury that requires season-ending surgery. So he's a guy that's, uh, that's getting back on track and I think has a chance to be an impactful player. Awesome. Love it. Uh, as always, Scott, I appreciate your time. And uh, do you have your own podcast, by the way? I do. It's called The Cowboy Chronicles, available on uh, on uh, Apple Podcasts. The Cowboy Chronicles. I'll make sure yes, to sir. put a link in the description so everybody can just click Fantastic. that and check that out. And is that a daily show or weekly? It's a weekly. We we, uh, we won't actually start until uh, until the season gets going. So we'll get uh, get going here uh, here the first week of September. Yeah, and you did this last year. Yes, exactly. Okay. Excellent. Scott, I appreciate it. And hey, you know what? If this team is actually going to overperform and if it ends up uh, doing uh, things that nobody's expecting, uh, then maybe we'll get an opportunity to talk again this season. Absolutely. Be glad to do it, man. Th thanks, Scott. You bet.